This is Jack Foley. I'm going to begin today's show with Steve Ross's version of Begin the Begin. When they begin the begin, it brings back the sound of music so tender. It brings back a night of tropical splendor. It brings back a memory evergreen. I'm with you once more under the stars. And down by the shore an orchestra's playing And even the palms seem to be swaying When they begin the beginning To live it again is past all endeavor Except when that tune clutches my heart And there we are swearing to love forever And promising never, never to part What moments divine What rapture serene Till clouds came along To disperse the joys we had tasted And now when I hear people curse The chance that was wasted know but too well what they mean so don't let them begin the beginning let the love that was once a fire remain an ember let it sleep like the dead desire I own remember when they begin the begin oh yes let them begin the begin make them play till the stars that were there before return above you till you Whisper to me once more, darling, I love you. And we suddenly know what heaven we're in when they begin the beginning. When they begin. The Begin That was Steve Ross singing Cole Porter's Begin the Begin. The track is from Steve Ross's album Cole Porter and Steve Ross Close. Begin the Begin was written in 1935. I've lived with this song, among many others, for much of my life. In one sense, it is very much like many other popular songs. For a song to be popular, it must be remembered, and there are many popular songs that contain strong, semi-subliminal hints that the listener should remember them. Irving Berlin's Remember is one, though the most egregious example 
as Herman Hupfell's As Time Goes By. The chorus begins, You must remember this. Begin the Begin is about a dance that brings back the sound of music so tender, brings back a memory evergreen. Many popular songs insist that song conjures love and memory. A pretty girl, wrote Irving Berlin, is like a melody that haunts you night and day. A phrase Porter used to considerable effect in a song of his own. On the other hand, Begin the Begin is unusually long for a popular song, and one is not surprised to learn that Moss Hart thought the song had concluded when it was in fact only halfway through. In his commentary on Begin the Begin, Alex Wilder groused that, quote, about the 60th measure, I find myself muttering another title, End the Begin. The song's unconventional form and its length has always been a problem. Originally, the penultimate line was, And we suddenly know the sweetness of sin. It had to be changed to, And we suddenly know the heaven we're in. The sudden, surprising shift from Don't let them begin the begin. Let it sleep like the dead desire I only remember to. Oh, yes. Let them begin the begin. Make them play. It's like the sudden, surprising key change, minor to major, in Porter's later song, I Love Paris. Producer Saul Chaplin remarked that that change was like the sun suddenly came out. Porter's song, True Love, sung by Bing Crosby and Grace Kelly in High Society, is another example of a significant key change. The song's primary theme is in the key of G major, but the release section is in E flat major and its relative C minor. The release ends with nothing to do. And the note to which do is sung is a D natural. The chord at this point is a B flat seventh. Porter holds the note and changes both the chord and the key. The next chord is D seventh, which leads us back to the G major theme. The threat of the minor mode, an important consideration in many songs is thus avoided, and Porter returns us to the primary theme by a kind of metamorphosis. D is held, but at one moment it's in one key, and at the next it's in another. Similarly, in I Love Paris, the minor half of the song ends with a C natural. The major half of the song begins with the same note an octave higher. Porter's awareness of the effectiveness of such shifts is explicitly stated in one of his lyrics. But how strange the change from major to minor every time we say goodbye. Begin the Begin is also an example of what Porter called Jewish music. He told Richard Rogers that the key to his writing hit songs was to write Jewish music. Rogers comments, I laughed at what I took to be a joke, but not only was Cole dead serious, he eventually did exactly that. Just hum the melody that goes with only you beneath the moon and under the sun or any of Begin the Begin or Love for Sale or My Heart Belongs to Daddy or I Love Paris. It is surely one of the ironies of the musical theater that despite the abundance of Jewish composers, the one who has written the most enduring Jewish music should be an Episcopalian millionaire who was born on a farm in Peru, 
Indiana. One of the great climactic moments of Begin the Begin comes with the exclamation, What moments divine! What rapture serene! Phrases set to the same theme that begins the song. These phrases are obviously and deliberately paradoxical. Moments are by definition temporal, the opposite of divine. The experience of rapture is intense, hardly serene. Indeed, paradox is everywhere in Cole Porter's work. Elsa Maxwell called him the most paradoxical man ever to invade show business. In her book on bipolar illness, Touched with Fire, Manic Depressive Illness and the Artistic Temperament, a favorite book of both Philip Lamentia and Michael McClure, K. Redfield Jameson talks about paradox and artistic creation. She asserts that there is strong scientific and biographical evidence linking manic depressive illness and its related temperaments to artistic imagination. Biographies of eminent poets, artists, and composers attest to the strikingly high rate of mood disorders and suicide, as well as institutionalization in asylums and psychiatric hospitals in these individuals. And recent psychiatric and psychological studies of living artists and writers have further documented the link. Manic depressive illness is a very strange disease, one that confers advantage, but often kills and destroys as it does so. Jameson writes of a formidable combination of imagination and venturesomeness and a restless, quick, and vastly associative mind, of the wide-ranging, expansive, wandering, and dendritic, branch-like possibilities of the human mind. Making connections between opposites, crucial to the creative process, she writes, is in many respects a specialized case of making connections in general, of seeing resemblances between previously unassociated conditions or objects, what one biographer of Porter called linking the unlikely. She refers to the coexistence of opposite emotional states such as mania and depression, the importance of their contrasting and fluctuating natures, and the need to come to terms with such wildly disparate perceptions, experiences, and aspects of personality. Such chaos in those ultimately to transcend it or shape it to their will can result in an artistically useful comfort with transitions, an ease with ambiguities and with life on the edge, and an intuitive awareness of the coexisting and oppositional forces at work in the world. The weaving together of these contrasting experiences from a core and rhythmic brokenness is one that is crucial to both the artistic and the manic-depressive experience. The amphibious, mercurial, many-personed, and highly responsive nature of both the artistic and manic-depressive temperaments is at the core of what they are all about, she writes. Not without reason does the word chameleon permeate the descriptions of the artistic personality. Implicit to both chameleonic and manic-depressive temperaments is the coexistence within one body or mind of multiple selves. Now, does that sound like Cole Porter? Rhyme, which is everywhere in Porter's work, is a powerful way of linking the unlikely 
and his songs certainly suggest the presence of a restless, quick, and vastly associative mind. Heights and depths, elation and depression, sudden shifts between major and minor modes are constantly asserted, as in the brilliant Down in the Depths on the 90th Floor, or But if, baby, I'm the bottom, you're the top, or in the key change in I Love Paris. In I Am In Love, Porter presents the coexistence of opposite emotional states. I am dejected, I am depressed, yet resurrected and sailing the crest. Here in the same song, he is presenting the painful and confusing aspects of these oppositions. Why this elation mixed with deflation? What explanation? I am in love. Should I order cyanide or order champagne? And aren't these lines from Let's Not Talk About Love chameleonic and evidence of a sense of multiple selves? This portion of the song begins with, of course, one of Porter's contradictions. Let's talk about love. That wonderful thing. Let's blend the scent of Venice with Paris in spring. Let's gaze at that moon and try to believe we're Venus and Adonis or Adam and Eve. Let's throw away anxiety. Let's quite forget propriety, respectable society, the rector and his piety, and contemplate l'amour in all its infinite variety. My dear, let's talk about love. Pretend you're Chopin, and I'll be George Sand. We're on the Grand Canal, and oh, baby, it's grand. Let's mention Valkyries and helmeted knights. I'm beautiful Brunhilde, your Siegfried in tights. Let's curse the asininity of trivial consanguinity. Let's praise the masculinity of Dietrich's new affinity. Let's picture Cleopatra saying scram to her virginity. My dear, let's talk about love. Yet, given that paradox permeates all of Porter's work, the phrases in Begin the Begin nonetheless seem different from the references I've quoted earlier. The words divine and rapture both have religious overtones. Encyclopedia.com has this to say about paradox and mysticism. The language used to express and describe mystical experience is richly paradoxical, figurative, and poetical. Without paradox, we cannot speak of the mystic's experiences. The British singer Hutch recorded a version of Begin the Begin on April 3rd, 1940. This recording was given to the Indian spiritual teacher, Mayor Baba, who asked that it be played seven times at his tomb when his body was laid to rest. Now, it may be that Mayor Baba recognized the possibility of mystical awareness in Porter's song, whether Porter intended it or not. Poets know that words often move beyond the limited intentions of authorship. And it may be that Meyer Baba was right, that this remarkable song reaches that far. I can't think of any other popular song that comes near it in its complexity or in the possibility of utterly transcending its genre. I think of the wonderful lines from another song of Porter's. Like the moon growing dim on the rim of the hill in the chill still of the night. I want to talk a little bit about the most recent film biography of Cole Porter. There was one in 1946, Night and Day, 
The most recent one is called De Lovely, and that came out in 2004. A friend of mine met a man who knew Cole Porter. My friend mentioned seeing a photograph of the songwriter dressed to the nines and with a beautiful woman on his arm. The image seemed to my friend the epitome of glamour, and he said so to Porter's friend. Cole? With a woman? said the man. That must have been something. The film De Lovely is all about Cole with a woman. The real porter was described by his friend and theatrical associate Arnold St. Subber as, quote, far queerer than anyone else I knew. Not so the Cole Porter of De Lovely. Kevin Klein plays Porter not as a homosexual, but as a heterosexual who goes to bed with men. De Lovely is a conventional love story affirming middle-class marriage despite Porter's homosexual dalliances. The film makes it clear that it is Linda whom Cole really loves. Indeed, the film's Cole Porter even expresses a desire for children, not something one would expect from the Cole Porter of the biographies. In the much-reviled 1946 version of Porter's Life, Night and Day, starring Cary Grant and Alexis Smith, Porter's real-life cruise buddy, Monty Woolley, is allowed to say that he disapproves of all marriages, with the exception of that of his mother and father. In Night and Day, however, just as in De Lovely, Cole really loves Linda. He is not a homosexual, but he is a terrible workaholic who doesn't give her enough attention. All the biographies agree that one of the major players in Cole Porter's life was his mother, whom he dubbed Kate the Great. She is nowhere to be seen in De Lovely. Nor is Peru, Indiana, where Porter was born. Nor is Yale, where he went to school. His tyrannical grandfather, who wanted him to be a lawyer, is absent from the film. As are Porter's prejudices, quote, Cole Porter didn't like colored people, remarked Orson Welles, who had worked with him. Porter's initial Broadway show, See America First, which bombed so badly that the composer claimed it drove him to join the French Foreign Legion, makes no appearance in Erwin Winkler's purportedly more accurate version of Porter's life. The Foreign Legion story was largely a fiction, but... Porter created many fictions, not least the fiction of Cole Porter. Ashley Judge's performance, which has been praised, is of little help. She's more like a transfigured American cheerleader than she is like the elegant, aristocratic Linda Porter, whom people found old-fashioned, not modern at all. In Cole Porter, a biography, William McBrien writes of the kind of elegantly Victorian manners Linda maintained. Uh, she didn't know how to open a door, said a friend. She'd just stand and wait for someone else to do it for her. It was also remarked that though Linda smoked, she never once lit the cigarette herself. Alexis Smith in Night and Day comes far closer to this conception than does Ashley Judd, who plays Linda as if she were essentially a take-charge, all-American girl. Indeed, the real Linda Porter was in fact at least eight years Cole Porter's senior. Ashley Judd is 21 years younger than Kevin Klein. Klein's Porter remarks more than once about how beautiful Linda is. Never does he say anything of that sort about his male lovers, who appear only briefly and are never much in the way of competition for Judd. De Lovely attempts to turn Cole Porter's life into a musical comedy, and it is not absolutely dreadful, but it is hardly the kind of musical comedy Porter wrote. It is more like Chicago than it is like Kiss Me Kate. Some, not all, of the production numbers are well done. Elvis Costello unfortunately looks like a fat Woody Allen as he sings, Let's Misbehave. I can't imagine anyone wanting to. 
But I thought Kevin Klein and Kevin McNally did a better job on Well Did You Ever than Bing Crosby and Frank Sinatra in High Society. The worst moment in the film is probably when an abridged version of Begin the Begin is presented as if it were the complete song. The Lovely also demonstrates Ashley Judd's wisdom in avoiding situations in which she has to sing. Her true love makes you long for the Grace Kelly Bing Crosby version, also from High Society. One could wish for a film which really was about Cole Porter, a complex, problematical man who wrote some amazing and to some degree subversive songs. The various elements of Porter's life are fascinating, contradictory. I don't think anyone has suggested, and certainly De Lovely does not, that Porter's marriage was at least in part the result of his paradoxical not of his sentimental nature. I can do anything. I'm a flamingly gay man. But I can have a wife, too. That Linda played a maternal role in Porter's life has been suggested many times. But it makes a difference to many of his songs if you understand that the recipient of all that passion was a man, not a woman. Do you love me as I love you? Are you my life to be, my dream come true? Or will this dream of mine fade out of sight like the moon growing dim on the rim of the hill and the still chill of the night. Cole Porter was certainly some kind of man, as Orson Welles has Marlena Dietrich say at the end of Touch of Evil. But unfortunately, and despite Kevin Klein's nuanced, intelligent performance, he wasn't the kind of man we see in De Lovely. This is a little poem, and the last line has two versions of the sound coal, C-O-L-E, C-O-A-L. And so another film, another life, that tells us all about you and your wife. She was the Statue of Liberty, and you the libertine who lit her cigarette. She forgave you when you would coquette, and worse, bad boy, and offered Mother Goo, poor Coley, did you fall down and go boom? In the silence of your lonely room, you dream of whips and slaveys and of things, of Kate the Great, who played the mother part. They were not made of gossamer, your wings. You were a flame and burned us to the heart. Cole. Cole. This is Jack Foley, and I've been speaking about the great songwriter, Cole Porter. Thanks for listening. Hey, happy birthday, KPFA. This is David Talbot. Join the chorus of well-wishers celebrating this mighty independent radio platform for their continued vigilance of speaking truth to power. And I know they speak truth to power because when no one else would touch my book, Devil's Chessboard, KPFA gave me a platform to talk about the deep state and the dark side of American power. So happy birthday, KPFA, and many, many more to come. KPFA has gone social. Media, that is. Stay connected to all things KPFA by visiting our Facebook and Twitter pages, where you'll be able to get special access to additional news and information from all of your favorite KPFA news and music programs. And make sure to check out KPFA's YouTube channel for never-seen-before musical performances and past KPFA author events. KPFA knows this is your station, and we want you to feel connected to us at all times so we can all continue to stay vigilant as always. Welcome.
Welcome to Literary Dialogues with Nina Serrano, bringing you wonderful poets and writers who focus on peace, justice, and a healthy planet. I'm your host, Nina Serrano. My guest today is Lucille Lang Day, and I'm going to focus on her recent book, Birds of San Pancho and Other Poems of Place. Welcome, Lucille Lang Day. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. I'm so glad you're here. It's been years since we've done an interview. I remember interviewing you about your memoir, Married at 14. And also, I remember very pleasant times where we exchanged poems at poetry readings. And very pleasant times reading together, too. Yes. I'd love to hear some poems from Birds of San Pancho and other poems of place a book that I've enjoyed quite a bit, quite a bit. So could we begin with one of the poems? Okay, I'll start out reading the title of a poem from the book, Birds of San Pancho. This takes place in the state of Nayarit, Mexico. So Birds of San Pancho. A great kiskadi sits on the casa wall, belting its exuberant song above the dusty cobblestone street. The bird is masked like a raccoon, its breast yellow as the butterflies that flit amid hibiscus and bougainvillea. Far from the casa, where palms and Maya nut trees grow lushly, a yellow-winged cacique waits in the paper bark tree, the lemony underside of its long tail cascading like silk. It surveys the scene, Ignoring the golden-cheeked woodpecker, streak-backed oriole, flycatchers, and scrub euphonia sharing the selva. Farther down the dirt road, where red ants live inside acacia thorns, a pale cow wanders alone, snubbing the fat chachalacas, singing chachalaca as I pass by. It seems the birds are out to cheer me, though I know food and mates are what they're after. A whole flock of orange-fronted parakeets feasts on berries overhead. Later, at the lagoon, a great blue heron, a little blue heron, a green heron, a night heron, Two great egrets, eight snowy egrets and 20 cattle egrets gather while brown pelicans dive for fish and the sun's bright disk sinks into the sea. When it disappears, the egrets rise in groups and pairs to settle in two coconut palms for the night. Oh, to sit up there too, safe having eaten my fill with folded wings, watching over creation. Thank you. That's one of the things that I love about your poetry. It's combination of your science background and your poet's heart, that the poet can feel herself in the tree as a bird, and yet that you can name so specifically the species of birds That's marvelous, and I I really admire it. Your training is both as a poet with advanced degrees in poetry and as a scientist. What kind of scientist are you? I trained as a biologist. I got my bachelor's degree in biological sciences, and then I went on to earn a master's degree in zoology, with a specialization in cell biology. And then I earned my PhD in science and mathematics education. Well, that certainly has been wonderful for you in poetry. It supports your poetry. It gives so much strength, the specificity of your actually naming things specifically like that. Thank you. Well, as it turns out in San Pancho, the birds are different from the birds in California. And I wouldn't have been able to identify all of those birds without the help of a local expert, Luis Morales Bayin, who is the director of the San Pancho Birding Network. And I had the, the great good fortune to go birding with him when I was in San Pancho. 
I was wondering about San Pancho. At first, I thought it was a mythical place because it's a nickname, Pancho, instead of Francisco. The actual name of the, the city in Mexico is San Francisco, but they don't call it San Francisco because everybody thinks of San Francisco, California. San, San, San Francisco, Mexico is a very tiny town, and so they gave it the nickname San Pancho. That's also the nickname of San Francisco here in California in the Chicano community. Oh, Very often people will that. say, yeah, San Pancho. You have I more have poems for us. Poem that I wrote in San Pancho that I would like to read, my dream hologram. In my dream, my daughter shimmered on stage as a hologram giving a lecture on sexual dysfunction for her fellow marriage and family therapists. They nodded and laughed at all the right times. I wanted to tell them she was such a terrific speaker, so witty and animated, because she'd studied dramatic art. I knew that she knew she had cancer, but expected to live. Only I knew she was already dead. No way would I tell her and break her heart. She was still my baby who'd bounced in time to the music of the Beatles, my mischievous toddler, my girl who sang on stage at Fairyland at five. Waking to the sea's murmur at Casa Obelisco in San Pancho, Mexico, in my room with the cool tile floor and a fan turning slowly overhead, I understood this was what had happened through all the long months of chemo, R-CHOP, rice, R-DHAP, GEMOX, PET scans, and radiation treatments. Both of us snubbed death the hated stranger grinning smugly, waiting so near. Even as the tissues around her lungs filled with fluid from the tumor and her breathing grew labored, I held her hand and told her over and over, hang on to hope, Leanna, you can still get better, as though my love could scratch a diamond or hold back the night. So beautiful, so painful. I remember from our interview about your memoir, Married at 14, The Birth of Liana. Yes, she was born when I was 15, as you know. Yes, it's a pain I'm sure that never goes away. That's right. It, it doesn't go away, but one learns to live with it. When Liana died, she left two beautiful children who were eight and 10 years old at the time. Now they're 15 and 17. And my love for her extended to them. But it's wonderful that she still exists through them. Yes. And that mother love exists for them through you. I also remember that we did a poetry reading where you read from a book that you had just written where you talk about them. That's right, yes. Previous um, poetry book, which came out in 2015, was called Becoming an Ancestor, and it's ab about ancestors, my contemporary family, and morality. And that, that book, too, contains poems about Leanna's death. And you have other poems for us? I do. So we'll read um, another poem that takes place in a town in southern France, and, and this is called abandoned in Sarla. My husband drove away, leaving me on Boulevard Eugène Le Roy in Sarla, France, on a May morning, near the Hotel Madeleine, with its blue shutters and saffron stones. I wondered if I'd taken too long in the bathroom that morning or made too much noise typing on my computer the night before. Walking around the corner to Rue de la République, I didn't have the heart to browse at La Lune Enchantée with its figurines, masks, and little jewelry boxes in the window. The Loire Blanche with brightly colored scarves out front 
or even Maison Pellegris, which boasted selling Macre de Canard Gras since 1890. Trying not to panic, I contemplated the monument inscribed Aux Enfants de Sarla, Mort pour la Patrie, 1914 to 1918. And the one that said, Aux Héros de la Libération de l'Arrondissement de Sarla, 1940 to 1945 which stood behind a fountain surrounded by grass and yellow, white, and orange flowers. Later, my husband said he'd spotted a parking place but couldn't fit our rental car into it. Then he got lost, couldn't find his way back to me or even to our B&B, Le Jardin. Still, I wept remembering that men and boys died in those wars and women waited whose husbands never returned. That's a beautiful poem. I think I have experienced similar. So would you like to continue sharing? Okay. I think I'll read one more poem that takes place from that trip to Southern France. Okay, so this one is called Child's Grave and Finery. A 10,000-year-old grave of a child about three years old, covered with ochre dust and marked with three stones, nestled in a rock shelter under an overhanging cliff in southern France. More than 1,500 beads carefully carved from seashells and animal teeth adorned his neck wrists, elbows, ankles, and knees. Marks inside the beads show a needle passed through them. They were sewn onto clothes that disintegrated long ago. Scratches and nicks on the outside imply the child wore these beaded clothes while he was playing. Anthropologists say this finery must signify hereditary social status. But maybe he was an only child whose grandmother polished the beads and sewed them onto his clothes while his father hunted and his mother gathered berries, the way a grandmother today might knit or crochet a sweater or blanket. Or maybe his parents were so broken by his death that they sewed all their own beads onto his burial clothes. So anyone finding his grave would know how much he mattered. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah. So I took that trip to Southern France. It was just two years after Leanna died. I, I wept at the museum where I saw the skeleton of this, this little boy who had, had died so long ago. I empathized for his parents. That definitely came through that poem. Do you have more? Yeah, so I'll move ahead now. And the first one I'll read is called Names of the States. Alabama, for the Alabama tribe, forced from Alabama to Texas, when white people claimed their land in 1805. Alaska, the Aleut word Alyeska, meaning mainland, the place toward which the sea flows. Arizona, the word for small spring in the Awadam language of a Southwest desert people who couldn't vote until 1948. Arkansas, Another name for the Quapaws, the downstream people who were removed to Oklahoma from their ancestral lands. Connecticut, from the Algonquian word for long river place. Delaware, from Baron de la War, Virginia's first governor whose name rechristened the local Lenny Lenape, the first tribe to sign a treaty with the U.S. Hawaii, for Hawaii Loa, discoverer of the islands in Polynesian myth. Idaho, maybe Shoshone, for the sun comes down the mountain, 
or the Apache name for the Comanches who drove them from the Southern Plains. Illinois, a French transliteration of Ilinwe, the Ojibwe word for the Anoka, whose 13 tribes were reduced to five by European disease. Indiana, land of the Indians, the Delaware, Piankashaw, Kickapoo, Wea, Shawnee, Miami, and Potawatomi, who were mostly removed by 1846. Iowa, from the Dakota word for the Iowa tribe, meaning sleepy ones. Kansas, the Dakota word for the South Wind people, whose last fluent speaker of the Kansa language died in 1983. Kentucky, derived from the Iroquoian word for on the meadow. Massachusetts, people of the Great Hills, that is the Blue Hills south of Boston Harbor, who were decimated by smallpox in 1633. Michigan, from Michigamaa, great water in the language of the Ojibwe who, like so many others, didn't understand the treaties ceding their land. Minnesota, from Minnesota, the name the Dakotas gave the Minnesota River, whose clear blue water reflected clouds. Mississippi, from Mississippi, Ojibwe for the Great River, along which more than 20 tribes lived and fished. Missouri, for the Missouri tribe that lived on the Missouri River, a Siouan people whose name means town of the big canoes. Nebraska, from Nebraska, the Omaha word for broad water, a description of the Platte River by which the tribe lived. New Mexico, named for the Mexicas, an Awadal-speaking people who ruled the Aztec Empire until the Spanish conquered them in 1519. North and South Dakota, named for a Sioux tribe whose men were sentenced in 1862 to the largest mass execution in U.S. history, though Dakota means friend. Ohio, from Ohio, continuously giving river in the language of the Senecas, whose land was flooded in 1965 following construction of Kanzua Dam. Oklahoma, from Oklahoma, Choctaw for red people, a name proposed by the chief of the Choctaw Nation during treaty negotiations in 1866. Oregon, maybe from Oregon, an Algonquian word for beautiful river, but so many native words and languages have been lost that it's hard to say. Tennessee, for the Cherokee town Tennessee, a village on the Little Tennessee River until the Cherokees were marched to Oklahoma along the Trail of Tears. Texas, meaning friends or allies in the language of the Caddo's who were removed to Oklahoma in 1859. Utah from Utahai, an Apache word meaning people of the mountains. Wisconsin from Mesconsin, the name for the Wisconsin River in the Miami language, river running through a red place. Wyoming, a contraction of Mechi Weameing, a Delaware word first used for a valley in Pennsylvania, meaning at the big plains. And yes, every part of this land is Indian country, from forest to desert, mountain to prairie, Manhattan to Yosemite, Tallahassee to Seattle, all the fields, rivers, hills, and canyons between the two shining seas. That is an amazing poem, Lucy how through a list you're able to tell the entire history, the horrible, bloody story. You have the deep connection yourself to the Native people. Yes. Uh, my mother was one quarter Wampanoag from Massachusetts. 
And how did you go about researching this poem? I knew that a few of the states were named named for indigenous words and the tribes of North America. And so I started Googling the history of all the state names. And I thought, my God, I, I, I couldn't believe it. But most of the state names are references to the American Indians or come from indigenous words or the name of names of tribes. And they reveal a horrible history. It is. It was really a, a story of genocide and a story that really has been suppressed, starting with the myth that Columbus discovered America. Hello, there were people here for at least 12,000 years before he arrived. He, di- he, he didn't discover America. He invaded America. And the people who came after him weren't kindly settlers. They were conquerors who were, who were conquering the people who were here first and who were much better stewards of the land. And you've done a lot of organizing around this through your poetry. Yes, I've also co-edited an anthology called Red Indian Road West, Native American Poetry from California. And I've organized a lot of readings. And that book tells a lot about the history of Native American people in California, both the tribes that are indigenous to California and the others who've ended up here. Because as it turns out... California has the largest Native American population of any state in the U.S., more than Oklahoma or any other place where you know that there are a a lot of Native Americans living. And one reason is that that during the 50s and, and early 60s, I think it actually started in the 40s, the U.S. government had a a tribal relocation and termination program where they were determined to remove the people from the reservations, give them some money, resettle them in, in, in cities throughout the U.S., and then take back the land. And so what came down was that uh, there were a lot of people who were relocated, and two big relocation centers were in San Francisco and Los Angeles. So a lot of people from tribes throughout the U.S. ended up in San Francisco and Los Angeles, and their descendants are still here. But one more thing about this tribal termination policy was that all of the tribes that except one that were terminated eventually were reinstated. There were lawsuits. And in the end, this policy did not fly, but it, it redistributed the Native American population and a lot of people left the reservations. So that's one way people came here. And then like, you know, in California, because of the economy, the universities, a lot of uh, Native American people have come here for jobs or to study. And so as a, as a result, we have more Native Americans than any other state. And I think that's, that's it's something to be proud of. I agree. Something to be proud of, as are the poem that you wrote. It has so much history and so little preaching. So I'll read an, another poem. This is called What Flows into the Gulf of Mexico. Melted snow from the crests of the Rockies rushes past pinion pines, limber pines, lodgepole pines, cork bark firs, ponderosas gathering silt as it reaches burr oaks, cottonwoods, staghorn sumacs, silver maples passes prairie cord grass, winds through cattails, duckweed, skunk cabbage, finally to mingle in the Mississippi with water draining from 31 states where hunter-gatherers lived with bison herds for 10,000 years. Now the river carries oven cleaner, human feces and caffeine, medical residue from hospitals and laboratories, scouring powder and soap from millions of homes, antibiotics from all the cattle ranches in the Midwest, solvents from farm machinery plants, pesticides from corn and soybean fields, ingredients used to make plastic, enough estrogen from birth control pills to bend the genders of fish, 
thousands of tons of herbicides, fertilizers that cause algae to form massive green carpets in the Gulf, which leads to an explosion of bacteria that decompose algae and kill everything in an area the size of Massachusetts each year. All this even before 206 million gallons of oil from the deep water horizon blowout, before hundreds of thousands of gallons of oil dispersant containing chemicals that destroy red blood cells and cause cancer. It all enters the shimmering translucent bodies of arrow worms and dinoflagellates consumed by oysters, the algae scooped up and eaten by shrimp. The crabs that crush mollusks and shrimp with their chelipeds, the sea bass whose stout jaws clamp down on any smaller creature. Of course, it's in our hearts and permeates our brains as surely as hope or anger. It's in your body and mine, these molecules that cling like lovers to our bones. Cling like lovers to our bones, all of these horrible things that will kill us and harm us. That, that's right. And, you know, and I don't write this to say, you know, this is hopeless. Look how we've destroyed the world. I write it to say, you know, this really needs to be changed. We need to have different farming practices. We need to have, to have different methods of waste disposal, hopefully, that involve recycling, breaking down toxic chemicals instead of just spewing them as is into the environment. Because science can, science can take care of this. We don't have to live so destructively on the planet. We don't have to clear cut forests. We don't have to fill the, the Mississippi River with toxins. We don't have to let so many species go extinct. We can live differently, and science can help us do that. We can send people to the moon, develop a vaccine for this horrible coronavirus in, in just one year. Actually, it was less than a year that the, from the time the, the coronavirus pandemic started to the time that the first vaccinations were given. So, you know, science can do am amazing things and it really needs to be used for the common good of people and of the planet. Well, I hear that in your poetry. I hear the hope in these poems. These have been wonderful poems. Wonderful. Thank you. How can people get your book, Birds of San Pancho, Other Poems of Place? It's available online. So the name of the book is Birds of San Pancho and Other Poems of Place, and you can get it online or maybe order it through your favorite independent bookstore. It's beautiful work, it's knowledgeable work, and it's filled with hope and love. And that's what we really need right now. So thank you so much. Lucille Lang Day for this conversation and for sharing these wonderful and inspiring poems. Hard Knock Radio's own Davey D and author Jeff Chang have a new book coming out, Can't Stop, Won't Stop, A Hip-Hop History. This American Book Award winner, now adapted for young adults, is the true story of hip-hop. Based on original interviews with DJs, b-boys, rappers, activists, and gang members, with many unforgettable portraits of many hip-hop founders and present-day icons. Can't Stop, Won't Stop describes the events, ideas, and music that were the hip-hop generation's rise to the present day. Jeff Chang and Davey D chop it up in a Zoom event happening Tuesday, April 20th at 7 p.m. To get the link, just go to kpfa.org and scroll down to the opening page to this event. Can't stop, won't stop selling madism. Can't stop, won't stop selling madism. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 
97.5 K24HBR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.